Hi, welcome to War Christ. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by Jason M. Baxter. Jason is an author, a speaker, and a college professor. He currently teaches in English and theology at the University of Notre Dame in the States. He's the author of five books, including The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis and Beginner's Guide to Dante's Comedy. So I suppose, first of all, Jason, how did you come to your love for the humanities broadly, this medieval period and the, the nuanced way that you describe it and some of the things that you've devoted so much time to with your studies? You know, what a great question. Yeah, I, I jokingly call myself a recovering Cartesian, <laughs> um, by which I mean, you know, like everyone in the modern world, I make this kind of, you know, great subject object divide. Mm -hmm. In which, as Lewis says, that uh, we, as moderns, well, and Charles Taylor says this as well in a secular age, we tend to think of that the true source of meaning is my agency, is my interiority, is my sort of emotional life. And all that stuff out there is just sort of dead matter colliding in fields of of of, of energy, as the 18th century Enlightenment uh, uh, Newtonian philosopher Laplace put it. If we could know the the trajectory and velocity of every atom in the universe, we could tell the whole world in advance and backwards that such was his boast, right? It's just a bunch of billiard balls out there, dead space, dead matter. Whereas what's real is within me. I think um, in my whole kind of journey in, uh, in, in Christianity and ultimately to become a Catholic, the, the idea of a liturgical and sacramental imagination has been has been enchanting to me. I guess what I've increasingly called a participatory or an iconic imagination in which um, it's kind of anti-deist in a way, right? Not full on pantheism, but it's kind of anti-deist in that it's it's that it's it's the Lord and the supernatural trying to make it into our world to the extent that it can. but it's limited by this uh, it's limited by our time and uh, our space and our historical reality. And yet the Lord is you know exerts, <laughs> to speak anthropomorphically, exerts great energy in order to try to make himself manifest. And this is what excites me so much, I think, about the medieval, is because it's trying to take these, these things that we as moderns separate, the spiritual realm and the physical realm, and trying to find really intelligent, really subtle, really interesting ways to talk about our, our life, our experience, our cosmos, um, as an iconic or participatory reality. And so I suppose um, one of my editors wants me to write something properly philosophical and properly theological, whereas most of the stuff I've done has been descriptive and historical. Maybe that will come one day uh, for, for David Augustine uh, um, at Word on Fire. But at the moment, what, what I've, I've just wanted to describe for myself with, uh, with you just to answer this question, why did our medieval ancestors find this compelling? What was beauty for them? Why was it not a, a peripheral phenomenon for them, but rather at the core of their being? What does beauty have to do with the love of God? What is holiness anyway? Those are the types of questions which I think our, we can put it this way, our medieval ancestors were to those types of questions. What we are to uh, technical questions in terms of the sciences. They had a kind of, um, can we call it? Um, experiential expertise in the interior life. Whereas, as uh, Lewis's buddy Owen Barfield said, our expertise is now the technical, the exterior, um, uh, and the sort of like graphing the properties of material bodies and mathematical space. Mm, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. And um, I want to get into that in more depth, particularly pertaining to your book on Lewis. But I'd love to, before we get there, ask a bit, a bit about your influences and if there are any figures who've been especially inspirational or influential for you that you'd like to tell us about, whether that's Lewis himself um, or whether that's Dante or some of these figures, academic, family or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely my... Uh, my teachers, especially this year that I spent in Ottawa, Canada, at a little tiny college called Augustine College uh, for 13 years. I, I love that place with all my heart. And I think that's when I went from from being a, a suburban kid uh, in the southern United States who used to go to, uh, to Barnes & Noble. And at the Barnes & Noble, I suppose this is the same in, in uh, across the Atlantic, there's this kind of like cheesy mural 
um, this fake mural, which is in every single Barnes and Noble in the in the Starbucks area, and it has the writers. You know, it has like James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, and and I don't know who was George Eliot is very it's very inclusive uh, tableau of writers, right? And I just I remember as this, this suburban kid in Arkansas who didn't know who those people were and hadn't read their books, longing to belong in their conversation. <laughs> Almost in a sort of like Lewis-like way, being magically transported, you know, into that two-dimensional surface and and listening to them. But I mean, so for me, I mean, Augustine College, going up to this little place in in Ottawa and meeting meeting these learned professors, meeting people like David Jeffrey, who is wrote on the Franciscan the Franciscan spirituality and its and its influence on early English poetry. And meeting people like John Patrick and Graham Hunter, philosophers and theologians and scientists, that was absolutely eye-opening for me. That changed everything for me. And so I, I, I suppose beginning with that, those are my, those are my personal bonds. Um, but I grew up, a, I grew up Protestant and uh, loved Jonathan Edwards. As is it a contrarian thing to do? Um, at least in this country, right? Jonathan Edwards is only only remembered as the author of the the famous sermon, "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." And I still love that sermon. I, I still think it's true. <laughs> um, and but he he did all kinds of other things in addition to that. So I would say between Jonathan Edwards and and C.S. Lewis, those are my uh, earliest intellectual influences, as well as um, a Protestant pastor here in the states called John Piper, who wrote a book called Desiring God. Um, and I think that for me that that was my kind of moral awakening, my spiritual awakening. And then at Augustine College, I, I realized as as one of my as one of my professors said, he was Protestant, so I suppose he had credentials to say this. He used to say to us Protestants, Catholics have have answered, have asked and answered questions which Protestants haven't even thought of yet. I was very offended by that. Um, but I suppose that what he was trying to get at it was there's this huge tradition of thought that that I, I was introduced to when I was there. And that were, that was in that was that was eye-opening. But I think you know, the funny thing is for Dante, even though I've written about him the most of my life. I didn't enjoy reading the comedy, at least the first, dare I say this, five times that I read it, maybe three or four times. I, I didn't see what the point was. Um, and so I think for Dante to become, I think at last I can actually call him what he calls Virgil. He calls Virgil il buon duca, il buon maestro, right? The good teacher, the good leader. Um, and now I think, of, but it's because I'm doing my translation, but now I think of him as il buon duca, il buon maestro. And I think now he's part of my my DNA. But yeah, between C.S. Lewis and um, and now now Dante and um, and probably also uh, Dostoevsky and Brothers Karamazov, um, between those things, I think it's probably very close to the the core of my of my original intellectual awakening. What a chord! <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Jason. So I'd love to home in a bit more about your uh, on your recent book, The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, How Great Books Shaped a Great Mind, and ask first um, what motivated that and what you hope the readers will take away and why especially home in on that perspective of Lewis that's, uh, that's not often emphasized. And um, I suppose if we might look at his medieval apprenticeship, as you refer to it, and why this element to his person is so significant, even if it is often overlooked. Yeah, I exactly. I think the book aims to show that Lewis was successful, not despite his day job, but because of it. And who knows, maybe it's, it's somewhat autobiographical. I'm trying to tutor a younger version of myself. And that I didn't know that he was, um, he was an Oxford Don and that his, his life was, devoted primarily with the study of medieval and renaissance literature until much later right i mean i knew him as an apologist and as a writer of fiction and so for me it was the the, the great revelation was when i was um when i was uh writing my dissertation in this tiny five foot by five foot uh carol on the on the 12th floor of the library at notre dame and you know, re reading all these very weird books, which I wouldn't even inflect on my students, right? I was reading Chalcedius and his commentary on on, uh, on the Timaeus, and I was reading Macrobius and Martianus Capella and Bernard Silvestris and Alan of Lille and all these things I just thought were incredibly recherche. And, you know, and no no one but me had heard of them. And then I'd go home in the evening and I'd read the Chronicles of Narnia to the kids. And I have these sort of, these kind of, you know, double take moments where I thought, wait a minute, is that... 
is Lewis quoting Calcidius there? And when I started to dig into this, I discovered, well, yeah, Lewis knew all this stuff. And of course, he writes about it in Discarded Image. And he gave introductory lectures to how to appreciate Renaissance literature, in which he said, let me do the heavy lifting so that you can do the enjoying. Um, and he read all these things and he read them, you know, he read them sometimes before they were even in proper editions, certainly before they were translated. He just went up into the Duke Humphrey's reading library in Oxford and just, you know, allegedly read the whole library in preparation for his 20 year preparation for his volume on 16th century literature. So he just knew it. He just knew it all. And he had read it into the point in which it, um, I guess maybe like, you know, to compare small things to great things. He'd read it to the point where, he, uh, you know, for me, like what, what Dante and Lewis are now to a certain extent to my in my marrow, right, in my in my bloodstream. <laughs> um, these things were for, for Lewis. And there are all these incredible moments where he opens his mouth seemingly in a very practical way, like when he's counseling Sheldon Van Aken after the death of his wife. And he starts saying, you know what, you should read, um, you should read Boethius, mm -hmm. you know, in, in get that Loeb edition with the facing page, Latin and English. And he says, you should, oh, you're probably going to have to read Dante's Paradiso, aren't you? And so this stuff is so, um, this stuff wasn't, that's what was kind of the great tip off, right? Is that this stuff wasn't, um, wasn't a mere academic archival scholarly interest for Lewis, but he thought that they really knew something. He thought that they'd seen something and it was too beautiful to die, but they had, um, they had said it in a language and in a mode of thought which had become foreign to us. And so what he had to do was sort of remove the gem, you know, imagine sort of, you know, your great grandmother's, you know, sort of precious jewelry, the sort of setting is tarnished, but you don't want to throw away the gems. If he could remove the gems and reset them in a fresh setting, then he could save these old ideas and they would seem fresh and relevant to us. And so when he writes, when he writes out of the silent planet, as you know, everyone will know who's read it, Go read the epilogue. He confesses it's just a plagiarism of Bernard Silvestri's Cosmographia, this weird 12th century Latin treatise, which is fearfully weird, fearfully <laughs> weird. Um, but Lewis takes it, and all of a sudden, it's, it's but it's basically medieval space travel. You know, Lewis adds rockets and and some bad guys, and he's got out of the Silent Planet because that because it was too beautiful to die, and so he was a he was a rescuer of old things. Interestingly enough, that's, that was his greatest compliment for Dante. He said that he had a tender care of old metaphors and old words. And so you sort of see Lewis kind of autobiographically confessing his desire to have this, like, like Aeneas carrying his household gods, his penates on his shoulders, as well as his father Anchises. Uh, so was Lewis with these, uh, with these old books. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. And um, I think on top of that, there's this element that comes across in your work and Lewis broadly of going beyond nostalgia, progressivism, presentism, seeing the big picture. I think you dem you demonstrate that in a powerful manner, how he ties together the past, the present, and the future. Um, I wonder if you might tell us a bit more about that and how we might understand the kind of anagogical spirit of his world, especially for me as a fulfillment of the great classics that he has surrounded himself with, in part because that was maybe one of my uh, bugaboos before I became a believing Christian. I, I had a conversation with Tom Holland and he was worried about the fate of Virgil and some of these figures. <laughs> and um, this, how that links in with this kind of long middle ages that you've spoken about and how he took up this, this project that in a wonderful conversation with Mark Vernon, you said uh, he built upon what Bethius had started and it seems that that's something that he'd be proud of. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. No. I think I think Lewis did think of himself as a modern British Boethius, and um, and what what I mean by that is that he regularly, jokingly, half jokingly, um, not jokingly, <laughs> calls uh, moderns machine using, te you know, technology obsessed moderns the barbarians, and and if they are the barbarians, then Lewis is the Boethius who's sort of, you know, desperately trying to save as much of the past as possible. And so rather than using these kinds of like razor sharp precisions and writing uh, lengthy disquisitions on, you know, the the difference between, I don't know, fifth century stoical influences and sixth century Neoplatonic influences on so-and-so, so-and-so, Lewis wanted just to talk about what they all had in common. I think he felt a sense of urgency that um, 
uh, like Boethius did. He Boethius just didn't have a lot of time while he's sitting in you know in prison waiting for his his execution. Analogously, Lewis. Yeah, but I think in terms of this anagogical cosmos, um, I write about this and um, you know and compare it to a cathedral. Um, cathedrals are very exciting for Americans because um, we don't have many of them. Um, in fact, um, Europeans say we have none. Right, we just have <laughs> as out of substance as dubious imitations, um, and so yeah, they're they're very they're very moving to us. And um, you know, the medievals felt of the the sort of natural world that it has this kind of mysterious harmonic order, and then the walls have become so thin that they're translucent, and there's this kind of light which is coming in. And Lewis just loved that idea, and I think. Um, I think he thought uh, two things about it. One, it's probably as a recovering Cartesian, um, as a recovering modernist, Lewis, like me, um, he thought that uh, he thought that if we could, that we could probably recover more aspects of it than we thought that we know. That in modernity we have been laid under this, this spell, he called it, of evil enchantment for several centuries, such that we might even be coming into contact with supernatural realities. I mean, there's a good chance we're surrounded by them right now, that there's a sort of field of invisible glory, which, uh, you know, which obviously we can't see through with, with physical and visible eyes, but, uh, but pure hearts that have gone through a process of, and have learned to love and thus become like God are better in tune with these things. Lewis, I think, thought that that was probably truer than a bunch of moderns knew. But then he also had this other interesting answer, in which I jokingly call it nostalgia for the future, in which he points out that, you know what, if you lived in the Middle Ages, and if you were, in some sense, lived in a, a porous, a spiritually porous world, in which uh, I think of sort of, you know, Paul King's North, right? You were close to sacred wells and relics and, right? And um, and you could, you thought that you were catching glimpses of the of the harmony of the spheres, the harmonia mundi. Lewis thought, well, you know what? It might actually be spiritually dangerous for you to be in such a spiritually soaked world, fascinatingly, because you might actually love these kind of like lower level uh, manifestations of uh, of the divine, rather than God Himself, and thus I think Lewis thought, almost like our, our American writer Flannery O'Connor, that the whole world was going through a dark night of the soul. Not just a few saints, but the whole world. But by entering into this, and this is connected to my to my mysticism book. This is where the mysticism book begins. But by entering into this spiritual desert, um, in which the consolations of the closeness to the divine are deprived to us that it it gives us this uh this sacred restlessness in which our longing for the consummation at the end of time is greater and thus maybe we're sort of you know maybe our medieval ancestors and our renaissance ancestors were more content with their earthly lives whereas i think it's difficult to be content in the modern world it's easy to be distracted but i think uh but i think this sort of sense of restlessness and this sort of sense of anguish right you you know from the age of edvard munch and the scream until now right um dare we say it, that's our spiritual gift dissatisfaction restlessness a, a sense of um a sense of incompletion I think so. In that case, that that makes us nostalgic for a future reality, as opposed to merely thinking, "Man, if I could have been, you know, there for the the crowning of Charlemagne in 800 A.D., right? Then things would have been good, right?" And I mean, I certainly, I certainly have that type of conservative nostalgia. But ultimately, um, and the, and and Tolkien writes about this on fairy stories, right? He says what they're all after. He's something which is older than antiquity itself, such as something which is on the other side of time. And it seems old to us, not because it's chronologically dated, but because it's coming from a different dimension. And that has the sense of antiquity. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you, Jason. And it dovetails beautifully with what I've been reading from you probably know this, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name of it, Eugene Rosenstock Hussey, Hussey 
this really eclectic, fascinating a kind of writer, philosopher, all sorts. It brings together so many different genres, but he constantly refers to this kind of eschatological significance of the Christian life, and it's it's a, informing how we live very much day to day. It's really powerful stuff and a real antidote, again, to that kind of bad kind of nostalgia. And I love your, your term, nostalgia, I think that's powerful. But um, I want to get back to Lewis, actually, and ask about, there's something that I think is most impressive in your work. There's a, a beautiful article, too, about Bob Dylan versus much modern music that maybe we can get into later. But you use musical metaphors to great effect in this work that we're mentioning, this Lewis work and elsewhere. Can you tell us a bit about that and this move from the symphony to the machine, as you mentioned, my Paul, friend Paul Kingsnorth, the machine age of the day, and how that helps us to understand Lewis and his continued significance then? Yes. Oh, I feel, I feel like that's the nicest compliment I've ever received, That um, <laughs> to know that people like my music metaphors. Um, I think I love my music metaphors so much um, because I'm a failed a failed musician and, you know, uh, quit piano as soon as I could to play baseball, um, <laughs> drive cars and do, you know, stupid things. Um, and but I think if I I think if there were such a thing as transmigration of souls and I, I as far as I, I don't think there is, but if there were such a thing and if I live this life, well, I think I'll come back as a pianist, um, <laughs> a concert pianist. Um, but yeah, I think. Yes, I'm very much in love with uh, um, with these mu musical metaphors, um, and I think um, there's a, this there's this wonderful, wonderful book which I can only understand about uh, one page in every ten, um, called Box Pattern and Mozart's Arrow, which talks about the aesthetic effects that modernity had on music, and I think if you if you trace these things out longer and longer, it gets more and more obvious. Um, if you listen to something like uh Deo Gracias, uh, a canon for 36 voices, or Thomas Tallis's, um Spim and Allium, you know, a motet for 42, 40 different voices, and these uh, uh, these eight choirs of, of, of five that were meant to sing in the round, then you see in, in some sense, right, this, this music doesn't have a plot. These sort of like, you know, this... The goal of, of of beauty was to overcome time, to spatialize time, as uh, Vodolaskin says in um, in Lauris, uh, to to create eternity moments, in which we finally and I think this is so telling for us for us you know hyperactive moderns, in which we can just get off the treadmill for a little bit, right? This sort of like stream of consciousness rushing on to my next activity. We think of ourselves as kind of like machines whose goal is to be as efficient as possible to create as much work units as possible. And this is what I call um, with my students, the, the internalization of the mechanized world picture that in some sense that we are uh, um, an F equals M a culture to, uh, to quote the, the famous uh, formula by Newton. And thus we think of, and Lewis, and this is also just Lewis and his, uh, his Cambridge address in 1954, the De Descriptione Temporum. We think of ourselves in terms of machines. Lewis says that we've now lived with machines for so long that it's, it's, it's snuck into the DNA of our language, our metaphors, and thus controls our feelings about ourselves, our success in our life. Right. I mean, we want to be productive in life. We want to maximize our potential. We go to human resource departments, um, and if you know, we we revert to default modes and um, don't have bandwidth to cover things. The the level of sort of like mechanized metaphor that's moved into our vocabulary is astonishing when you begin to kind of count these things up. Um, and so our medieval ancestors, in some sense, were the exact opposite. They didn't want to hit the accelerator and accomplish more work within T squared, but they wanted to experience what Boethius called the simultaneous experience of the fullness of life, the simultaneous experience of the fullness of life, eternity, in which for a, for a, that's how he defines eternity. And I think, I think we sort of sense this as moderns, right? Um, that we have, uh, who knows, even now, perhaps, we have these types of moments in which we recognize that um, something from something from outside of the simple dimensions is beginning to move in. And I wish I were better at actually resting in it, in it, delighting in it, 
uh, praising it, worshiping in it, and moving into this sort of state, which I, well, your whole podcast, in which I have more Christ, in which I can sort of, you know, stand in that, in in firm, steadfast stability. Um, I think that's that's what our medieval ancestors thought that their art was for. That's why they built cathedrals and wrote poems and created what we would badly call symphonies, because um, mm -hmm. they're not really symphonies, um, because they work differently. The music works differently. The music is meant to freeze time um, as opposed to hasten through it. In light of that, if you, I mean, the obvious thing, and I have written about this, uh, uh, if you look at, you know, Rihanna, um, this is what you came for. Uh, I've, written, I've, written, I've written on her and compared her to Mendelssohn. People think my my buddy James thinks it's unfair. Um, <laughs> but even if you even within the sort of domain of, the, of of classical music, right? And someone like John Adams, right? A short ride. How's it go? A short ride on a fast machine. <laughs> Isn't that what it is? Um, or his fearful symmetries. The whole thing is basically just just pounding forward within time. When you realize that, you realize that our, our medieval ancestors had a type of wisdom, a type of experience, which has become preciously rare to us. Mm, that's powerful. Thank you so much, Jason. So um, I'd love to dive in there and ask you about Bob Dylan, actually, uh, <laughs> just as a broad question, but I don't want to go off the, <laughs> the book so much. So I'll, I'll keep it. I'll try and rein it in. So the next question I have pertaining to Lewis specifically is <clears throat> something I can only really ask very few people and yourself being uh, an expert in all these wonderful classical books. Uh, I've, I've been best to, to get to know Spencer Clavin, who's doing wonderful work in this area too, and his favourite intellectual of the 20th century is Lewis. So uh, I've got to ask him a little bit too, but it's a blessing to have you here. So uh, as a broad point, maybe... Uh, and as a, an apologist, how does Lewis go beyond that kind of mere prepositional Christianity that, that became dominant maybe with modernity? And uh, I think here in terms of Plato's kind of tripartite structure of the soul, and how does he speak to these different elements of human beings? And what do you find encouraging about that then? Yes, <laughs> what a, an amazing question. Um, well, I think it's, I think, you know, one of the terms that maybe we're looking for is this idea of an argument from desire. And I think it's Lewis's way of resurrecting a very old and very interesting idea. Um, the American philosopher Plant, uh, Plantinga, um, picking up on Calvin, you know, talks about it as the sense of the divine, the sensus divinitatis. Um, and I mean, the more I read, the more I realize, the more I think that this is just the pre modern world. And the idea is something like this is that if um, if there is a God, then nothing in creation can exist apart from him. Uh, therefore, uh, that in our best selves, <laughs> our truest selves, there's there's still a connection to him because we can't entirely escape him. We, we if if God, not that this could happen, but if God in some sense went out of existence, everything would just disappear, right? Um, it's not like if God died, <laughs> as Nietzsche had hoped, uh, that we'd continue to live on without him. No, we would just disappear because he's the ground of our being. Um, if, and if that's the case, then there's a piece of the soul which is aware of that, even now. Um, and the ancients called it nous in Greek. And uh, in the Latin tradition, like in Boethius, they seemingly call it intellectus or intelligentsia. Um, but this is the best part of the soul. It's the secret part of the soul, which is already in communication um, with God. Okay, that's the medieval idea. So I think that someone like Lewis thinks that most of his job as an apologist is to clear away the rubble um, in which I can uh, I can just acknowledge the sort of yearning of a heart for yearning of the heart for the divine. And perhaps uh, his that he's presently haunting me, and that's why I mean a lot of a Lewis's apologetics is very moral, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, and that as moderns we think that you know let me do the syllogisms, let me run my logical per permutations and do my positivistic science, and then I'll make a decision, right? For us, sort of fact and value are um, are are separated, right? As soon as I factually determine what is the case, I will choose it with my will. That will be my value. Right. 
um, for the medievals, and I think Lewis has picked up on something really interesting, is that um, because truth is <laughs> the pleroma of being is richer and more abundant than I can fit into the mere ratiocination of my ordinary language, then morality is important for me coming to perceive that richness, fullness, and abundance of being. Thus, for Lewis, I think, as the apologist, you're talking about sort of um, weaving together the parts of the soul. Um, that is, my pursuit of God can't merely be um, a rational pursuit. It needs to be that. But if it's only that, it probably will fail. I'll always be sort of flipping back and forth, as he says, from looking at things from below and looking at things from above. And he says that in transposition. And they're both compelling explanations. But what I also need to do is to be pure uh, and to be generous and to be loving and to be less selfish and um, to be less avaricious. And and as the ancients said, when you become like God, you will see him. I mean, Father Zosima, Zosima says that as well in the Brothers Karamatsa, right? When you pr practice active love, you will have the consolation of knowing him who is love. So I think I think Lewis thinks of something like that, and then the experience of beauty as this incredible, this incredible opportunity, because we can't explain it, right? We can't, yeah, you know, to use a, mes a musical metaphor, right? We can't explain why the opening bars of uh, Gustav Mahler's first symphony are so haunting, right? Plato says that when you encounter beauty, um, you know, whether in artistic or uh, human form, that the soul sprouts wings and begins to flutter. Surely that's what we experience. We were talking about the, the landscape of Wyoming earlier. Surely that's what we experience in landscapes like that of Wyoming or um, the late string quartets of Beethoven or, um, or these ancient cathedrals or when we finally understand it, Dante's comedy, right? That uh, these beauty moments are in a way, better indications at the fullness of reality than the system of arguments is. And I think and I think Lewis sort of, in his uh, right-brained learner kind of way, <clears throat> intuited that this was at least one of the apologists' task, was just clearing away the rubble such that um, we stopped for a brief while asking, is there a God? and reconceive the desire to discover that there is one. That's beautiful. Thank you, Jason. And um, another element of your work, I think, ties in with a figure I mentioned to you, Dr. Michael Martin, who's doing some really interesting stuff in retrieving the weird <laughs> in the Christian life and so on. <clears throat> is Tom, the story in Tom Holland has mentioned this and others have been encouraged and even coming from that kind of secularist background, although he's a lot closer to the Christian faith now, if not uh, ostensibly Christian. And um, they've been encouraging Christians to lean into the, the weird of the Christian faith and so on. I suppose from your perspective, uh, why should that be the case? Why should we embrace that? And what are some of the ways that you've done so? And how has that changed your life then? Right, yeah. Is that a fair question to ask? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a cool question. Um, I think uh, Christians need to look different than car driving, shopping mall, buying, Amazon purchasing, earbud listening, technology saturated um you know protocol following our, our our colleagues in the world right who think that professionalism is the highest virtue um I, I don't think that driving cars is wicked i don't think that shopping at su you know super uh supermarkets or uh shopping malls is you know evil but i think i think there are it's very much detached from a uh, from a great sense of fullness, and I mean one of the joys of being a human being is um, 
well, as Lewis might say, is that it's transpositional. That is, these these ordinary um, daily acts of sort of exchange between each other can be elevated over the course of time from a mere act of com communication to to one of communion. And we can build these thick and rich communities. And I think um, I think that Christianity, um, with its roots in the pre-modern world, knows that and feels that in its bones and its um, and and thus I think for us to yes. So I don't know. Are we weird? <laughs> um, I mean, well, maybe that's the funny thing, right? We're we're weird by uh, secularist mm -hmm. standards which believes that we should just get over our fear of replacing all of our body parts with, you know, you know, transhumanist utopian dreams and upload our consciousness to right. Uh, you know, to clouds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. If that's what being weird is, yeah, I want to be weird, you know, because I want, <laughs> it's going to sound strange. Um, I want I want to be close to, I want to be close to my Lord uh, every now and then, especially when I'm reading a bunch of St. Francis I even want to offer up my bodily ailments for him, my sicknesses for him. Uh, and Francis, you know, St. Francis can even sometimes make you look forward to death, that this sort of like a great transitional moment in which we can finally consummate the process of becoming uh, becoming near him. And that's, remember Tolkien at the beginning of the Silmarillion says that Iluvatar says, I will give them a gift and it will be death. That in some sense, part of the mortal process, and I think Homer is on to this already in the Odyssey, 700 BC. I think part of the part of the pain of being mortal and part of the, the magical gift is that we don't get to live forever. We don't get to live in perpetuity. Um, we, we have a very finite life. And so how we spend our hours, how we spend our days, how we spend our minutes, maybe even sometimes seconds, is a precious gift because we choose this and not something else. And that's with our sort of like intention and our time, we can we can give the gift of presence and and uh, an incredible gift of love, and it is a gift if we if we think about how you know if we number our days aright, as the psalmist says, if we count our days. So, in what ways am I weird? Um, my teenage girls, sixteen and fourteen, don't have cell phones. They don't even have cell phones. They don't have iPhones. Um, now, at their little school, about 50% of the kids don't have phones, which is rather unusual. Um, but that's pretty weird in our in our day. Um, I, I I don't have a problem with social media. Um, I think it can become problematic. But just for me, uh, for my own personal mind, because I tend to be a high anxiety kind of guy, I, I'm not on any social media whatsoever. Um I think if I were, I'd be trying to manipulate it and I'd try to be like selling my books and I would find myself, me personally, this is the the depths of my depravity now confessed and international uh, transatlantic uh, podcast. I, I think I would, I would be making posts um, in order to make myself seem intelligent and interesting and deep so that people would buy my books. In other words, <laughs> I would be practicing vainglory <laughs> which Dante describes in, in Inferno 22, um, in order to pursue avaricious desires. Um, so I am, I myself, I'm not on social media. I'm glad that other people are. Um, I, I don't read the news. I can't handle it. I get deeply anxious about it. And I just, I worry about all kinds of things. And so um, I have a very, I have a very slow life in a way. In which I I listen to a lot of books as I'm uh, walking or driving around town, I spend I probably spend more time with uh, with ancient authors than modern authors, um, and so I think in a way I think my life feels very slow, and uh, my family's life my family life feels very slow in that sense, but not in the sense of dull or empty, but in the sense in a sense of like abundant spaciousness. Um, we eat together, we uh, we pray together. We read together. We spend time. Uh, I have three big kids and three little kids, and the the big kids help us take care of the little kids. Um, we spend a lot of time together, and I think in 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 a way, at least by modern standards, mm -hmm. our life is very medieval, in that sense, and that we spend a lot of time to with each other and enjoy each other's presence. I mean, obviously not without conflict, right? Um, and I spend a lot of time, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, attending liturgical services, trying to pray, uh, trying to learn how to pray. Uh, which I think is uh, a difficult art. Um, so that's pretty weird, isn't it? 
<laughs> I guess you could say what's possible. weird is how slow <laughs> it's how slow my life is. Mm-hmm. But I suppose now that as I'm sort of, you know, externally processing this, I suppose maybe I'm trying to do, you know, in a use an American grading system in a C minus kind of way, right? Sort of, you know, <laughs> average-ish kind of way. Um, I'm I'm trying to practice practice spaciousness. I'm trying to realize eternity even in the course of my of my fleeting uh fleeting moments. And uh and yeah, I think when you I think you could almost come up could come up with a formula, right? Does this activity help me bring spacious abundance and fullness of life? If so, it is good. If not, it is to be avoided. I think I just plagiarized Paul Kingsnorth, by the way. He says <laughs> he says something very much like that in one of my favorite articles by him. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. Thank you so much, Jason. And I appreciate how integrated um you're living out the Christian life. And that's something I love in Lewis too. And what you're doing with your family and so on, I think is phenomenal. From my perspective, I'm curious now, in line with what you said how that scales up uh, that we as Christians live this alternative modernity or maybe there's probably better ways I could phrase it and um, find those Chris- distinctly Christian rhythms and so on that you're hinting at and uh, I'm particularly interested especially given your expertise in this area how that ties in with classical education and schools because there seems to be a lot of good stuff in America with homeschooling and so on and then it seems to be good classical schools it seems to be Charlotte Mason enthusiast. I think it's wonderful stuff. And that's inspiring to me, but there's not much of that in Ireland, unfortunately. The Catholic schools or Church of England, Church of Ireland schools are still very much just prepositionally Christian, but that hasn't informed their whole perspective. And I'd be interested in hearing some maybe advice from you for those of us across the water here and um, what you would like to see in that regard that, um, say, for classical schools for young people over here because from my perspective i would love to be part of setting up a c.s lewis classical school in ireland and i've been in touch with a few folks about the possibility of that so god willing down the line we could do that but i'd just love to hear some of your thoughts on that and how that ties in with what you're doing with your family and so on does that make sense yeah well that's beautiful i think um and again i i'm just not entirely sure about the the legal structures in ireland um but it seems uh you know, maybe one of the virtues, America has loads of vices, but maybe, <laughs> but maybe the, one of the virtues of this country is that kind of like <laughs> uh, reckless entrepreneurial activity. If it's good, I will try it, <laughs> which means a sort of, a sort of a contentment with, um, and maybe this is harder for a European to imagine, right? That uh, an American is willing to, you know, set up shop in a, uh, a strip mall made of, you know, a cheesy metal building. Um, that you know we rent for four hundred dollars a month, and we're willing to start with you know sixteen students, and a lot of these things bust, but then some of them actually make it, and I think that sort of you know that kind of uh, the love of that which is good uh, can be very compelling and very beautiful. You don't need the infrastructure to do it. You don't need to have uh, an old school <laughs> built of stone, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many American schools, including uh, where my college I used to teach, Wyoming Catholic College. That is like a, a soul in search of a body. Um, and but you know, the this what we have is is communion, faculty members who love students and students who love the faculty member, and people who have conversations and talk. We have the the beating heart of uh, of an educational endeavor. So maybe that's at least you know one one um one thought. The second thought is that you know, these days a school is the modern is a modern piazza, right? It's where it's where we come together. It's where we, you know, spend time uh, and commune with each other, um, and so it has this incredible social function, um, well beyond uh, the education of the children. I think any classical school should uh, um, should double down on its Latin, uh, being a, a Latin teacher, um, and should should teach Latin not as a utilitarian activity to in, you know, improve your vocabulary for your test scores and your standardized exams, but should do it because it's rich and complicated and beautiful. I think uh, a classical school should endeavor to have the children learn as much by heart and by memory as possible, to sing as much as possible, 
um, that if they could sing, you know, the 22 best Latin hymns by memory, that's a goal. They should have, they should have lyrical poetry memorized, um, such that you can give them any word and they could finish it. Um, I had this incredible experience, uh, once in which I was reading brothers Karamazov and I uh, just finished this chapter, which, uh, Gr Grushinka tells the story of the onion, right. Um, in which the story goes there once upon a time was a miserly old lady and she was going to go to hell. And one day a beggar came by and said, can I have some food? And she said, I guess you can have that onion over there. And that was the only good deed she did the entirety of her life. And then she went to hell. And she was burning in the lake of fire, the story goes. And yet uh, Our Lady, uh, on her behalf, pointed out to the judge, the great judge himself, that she had done one kind deed. And so they agreed that they would they would do a test. And an angel brings down an onion to the lake of fire and says, if you hold on to this, I will pull you out. So she begins to you know, be pulled out by this onion. Um, and But the other souls realize that this is their ticket out. So they grab onto her ankles and other souls grab onto those ankles and like a, a paperclip being pulled out of a box, it's creating this chain of souls. Then it looks like the whole lake of fire is going to be emptied out until the miserly old lady looks down and an envy says, this is my onion, get off, shakes her leg and the stem of the onion snaps and they all fall back down into hell. Um, I tell this story because I just read it and um, one, my kids were fighting and uh, my my fourteen year old was being rude to to her brother, and as I was about to go into like a dad sort of fashion lecture mode, <laughs> then I just stopped for a moment. I said, "Can I just tell you a story?" And I told that story. And when I concluded, she said, "All right, Dad, I'll go apologize to Johnny." <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought, "This is great." <laughs> I didn't even draw the moral. I mean, maybe the moral is rather obvious. That's what. <laughs> Um, but I didn't draw the moral. I didn't preach. I didn't reduce it to a PowerPoint show with bullet points. I just had a story. And I thought, how many other occasions of life, if I had preloaded stories, I'd be wise. I'd be a man of depth that actually be capable of ministering to my children to and to my friends because I'd have stories for them. Hey, this is starting to get really Irish here. Um, but what if we began to think of, uh, of education as um, equipping equipping our children's minds and our own minds with the furniture of story and with song and with lyric. There are other things too, of course, but I think, I think this is, I think this is a beautiful thing, which will enable if, if we can, if I can declare this, the theme of the, uh, of the podcast, having, uh, having arisen emerged naturally, this will, this will be the thing which will en enable us to uh, practice, engage in practices of spaciousness. Um, right, in which we won't be giving that type of advice that feels that it, um, you know, the sort of advice you sometimes get from your mom and it makes you want to do the exact opposite, <laughs> right? <laughs> you shouldn't do that, honey. If you do, you'll get a disease. Like, well, fine, I'll just run the risk, right? <laughs> but in some sense, like, you know, the, you know, the good of story is that it carries reality and its complexity. And his difficulty and his beauty and the sort of, as you said earlier, uh, Marcus, in the sort of like uh, the, the the tripartite soul woven back together. I think that could be a guiding vision uh, for uh, for classical schools, both here and across the Atlantic. Hmm. Amen. That's a beautiful uh, place to finish for this evening, I think, Jason. Thank you so much. I have so many more questions, but I'm cognizant of your time and God willing, we can get together again um, in the future, uh, online or in person, as I, I was hinting at before we started recording. So hopefully we can make it happen. Um, just to close then, is there, I suppose, is there anything else that you're working on presently that you'd like to tell my viewers or listeners about and maybe where they can find out more about you and your work? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um I have a website. It's uh it don't don't criticize me for I have my social media diatribe and then I possess a website. It ha it helps me with practices of spaciousness. That's what I tell myself. Well, it's a modern day business card. I have a website, it's jasonmbaxter.com, jasonmbaxter.com. And uh here in the States, I sell I don't I can't ship abroad because it's too expensive, but here in the States I, I sell my books uh to my readers and uh, sign them. And my readers get all excited because I pack them 
in whatever lecture notes I've just finished or whatever poem I've just annotated, or I don't give them student papers. Um, but I just you know, grab my other and sort of pack them that. And, and the readers think that's just brilliant. Apparently, Jeff Bezos doesn't do that for his his customers. Um, but Jason M. Baxter, I have a, I have uh, some popular articles, some some things which have appeared on First Things, uh, some writing about uh, about technology and uh, not just the relevance but the urgency of uh, of the humanities, which you can find uh, on my website. And currently, I'm doing two things. Um, well, I'm doing a million things, but two of the things I'm doing. Um, I have just uh, submitted to my publisher, to Angelico Press, a rough draft of Dante's uh, Inferno, a new translation with an introduction, which uh, I don't know if it's good, but I think it's the best thing I've ever written. Uh, uh, introduction to Dante, and I, uh, I wrote it from the heart. Um, and that Inferno translation will be out in March through Angelico Press. Um, and hopefully I'll have time to make an audible recording of it, which will ease the the delivery for uh, for transatlantic readers. Um, I'm also working on a book for Word on Fire, um, tentatively called uh, Father Zosima's Little Way, uh, Dostoevsky's Icon. And it's about the role of uh, of Byzantine and Eastern spirituality in Brothers Karamazov and uh, Dostoevsky's confrontation with modernity. Wow, most look forward to it. And I'm really glad to hear that you're involved with Word on Fire. I've got to know a few of the folks there and I think they're doing wonderful stuff. Speaking about beauty and leading with the beautiful, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, Jason. It's been wonderful to speak with you and um, God bless you and your continued work. Thanks, Marcus.